and I've watched the economy need them. There is something called too big to fail. Like, America needs these companies because they create the jobs. When their jobs are, that are created, people spend money. Where do you spend money? At these companies. Mm. You give them the money, they hire more people. America wins when money's circulating. The, the moment money slows up, mm. that's not good. The moment money right. goes too fast, that's not good. So the Federal Reserve regulates the movement of money. So in this case, America can't live without publicly traded companies. Are you ready? We're going to run the yeah. play. Let's Do you go. know what it's like to come from nothing at all? But every day you just wanting it all. Do you know what it's like? Every day facing your fear, but believing that your blessing is near. Do you know what it's like? Growing up broken than most, but still being devoted the most. Do you know what it's like? Yeah, that's what the journey's about. Yeah. Let me show you how. What's going on, y'all? This is Justin Owens, back at the Run the Play Show, where I help break down the top plays of success from top leaders, entrepreneurs, and personalities by sharing gems from their personal playbook. And uh, listen, I'm excited today because I'm going to get in my own notepad because I'm about to learn about some stuff I have no clue about. Uh, we've got uh, an incredible financial mind in the locker room today, uh, Miss Ashley Fox. How you doing? I am doing well. I like that. Financial mind. You know what I'm saying? I've never been called that. I like that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So... <laughs> Uh, let's talk about money. Everybody like to talk about money. Okay. Um, and I it, here's my thing. I really feel like sometimes money's overcomplicated. Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes people overcomplicate it a little bit, and it's like it's like a lot of big words, so it confuses you. And then you know you try to let somebody else do it. Um, what do What do you think? Do you, Do you think like a financial advisor is important, or do you feel like a person should learn how to do it themselves? So I think I always tell people. You have to learn how to do it yourself first. Because when something goes wrong, you can't blame, blame the advisor. Correct. I do think everybody, because we all like money, mm -hmm. we all should know where it is. There's a lot of people who have accounts, who have investments, and they don't know where all their money is. Yeah. But you also want to make sure you understand the language of money. So I always tell people, when I teach people about finance, it's like learning a new language. And okay. in order to learn a new language, you have to speak it, yeah. read it, and be around people that are talking it. If not, you're going to lose it. Yeah. So I think if, if wealth building... And so, that's something that you want. You want to start learning, growing, speaking, and surrounding yourself around people who want to build wealth. So, yes, a financial advisor is fine, but you don't need a financial advisor. The other thing, too, when you think about financial advisors, you also have to understand how to get paid. Okay. Because financial advisors can charge you a fee, mm -hmm. or they can make money based off of the amount of assets that you give them, which typically leads to people who have a lot of money, they're more drawn to those individuals or they may sell some sort of product or service that they have access to. Yeah, no. So it's understanding, one, how they make money, because mm -hmm. that will dictate how they teach you, yep. how they give you a product or service, and how they guide you, but also understanding that language, because a lot of people in finance, like you said, like it could be big words, big numbers, and it's a foreign language. Yeah. If you spoke a different language right now, we would not have a thorough conversation. That's a fact. So it's important for you to know the basics. It's important for you to know what they're doing, why they're doing it, but no, honestly, I think everybody can be their own financial advisor. Okay. I think it gets to a point where you have so much money that you need <laughs> someone to manage your assets. Correct. But if you're just starting out as a beginner, if you don't understand what a stock is, you shouldn't be paying someone to do something with your money that you have no idea what is in the first place. Got it. All right. But if I'm starting out, okay. I'm like, well, but where do I learn all this stuff and where do I find these people that speak that language? You know what I'm saying? Like, where, where's... So, well, I came from Wall Street okay. and I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. And when I worked on Wall Street, I worked with individuals that had at least 25 million. Mm. So my perception of what money looks like, what you have, how you protect it, how you grow it, comes from the mind of a millionaire or billionaire. Got it. Now, I learned on Wall Street that for something we use every day, it's not taught in our school system. Mm -hmm. If you didn't grow up with money, then you're not talking about it at the dinner table. Right. But that doesn't mean you don't deserve to build wealth. And so I ended up leaving Wall Street just to answer that question you have. Mm -hmm. Where do we go if we want to learn how to invest? Mm -hmm. If we don't have a lot, didn't grow up with much, don't know anything about money, where do we go? Because you can't walk to a bank. Their right. job is to sell you a product, mm -hmm. not to educate you. Right. My job at Empify, which is my company, okay. is to educate you. The more we educate you, the better our product is. So there's essentially a company now that exists that can give you the financial tools and resources to help you execute. So not only do we just teach you my job is to make sure you produce results. So if we're going to teach you what a stock is, I'm going to make sure you actually understand how to buy a stock, how to grow your portfolio, how to build wealth for you and your family. Got it. Okay. So I like that. We're, there's a lot of ways to invest in mm -hmm. the stock market, right? Mm -hmm. what, what do you recommend? Because I know sometimes people say options. Some people just say penny stocks. I've seen people do. I've seen people do just regular, you know, 
big companies and what do they call it, like blue chip companies, blue chip <laughs> stocks, you know? So like, what, what's your what's your recommendation? So one, I wouldn't recommend anything unless I know you, right? Okay. So one of the things you have to think about when it comes to how you invest is what is your time horizon? Mm -hmm. What is your capacity, right? So I don't trade. Okay. I, don't, I don't. I tried it one time. It was too time consuming. <laughs> yeah. I'm here to build a billion dollar business, mm -hmm. right? But I know that I can invest in these blue chip companies, yeah. which are the biggest and best companies in this country. Because if they're making billions, why not? Why can't I just make some money while you're building your business? I can build mine while you build yours by owning stock in a company. You have a piece of that company. So I would say, as a beginner, the first way you start mm -hmm. is to one get a brokerage account open, which okay. is the account you need to buy stock, right? Okay. That's the easiest way to do it. The you second, recommend anyone? So I so, so I come from Wall Street, yeah. and so I think there's a lot of new apps that exist, mm -hmm. which are great for beginners. I think they're great to start, but not to solely finish. And so for me, I like the Charles Schwab, which used to be TD Ameritrade, the E-Trades, the Fidelities. Yeah. Now, the newer apps, if individuals do have those apps, they're fine. Yeah. But to do the things that, as you evolve from from the how, the characteristics, so I always say brokerage accounts are like cars. Okay. You get a car to go from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Now there's different brands. Yep. There's different features you put inside the car based mm -hmm. upon the person. Yep. So some people like more education. Some people like an easier interface. So you pick the brokerage account based off of the features. But I personally think I like the companies that have been around for years yeah. that didn't create their business to, to adapt to the times. Because investing right now is trendy. Yeah. When I was on Wall Street back in 2010, yeah. it wasn't the sexy thing on the internet. People right. weren't talking about it. So as the, as the world changed, which is a great thing, companies were created to adapt to the new change. So get your brokerage account open. I like the Fidelities, the Charles Schwab's, the um, um, E-Trade, things like that. But the other thing I tell people to do is to make a list of where you spend your time, money, and energy. Before okay. you think to go trade anything, think about where you're a loyal customer. Because every business continues to grow its revenue if they're making money. Right. So think about where you, what you eat, where you, what TV shows you watch, what networks you watch, yeah, what apps you use, mm -hmm. social media, right? Like where you, the food you buy, the supermarkets you go to, right? There are millions and billions of dollars generated just because yeah. we exist, mm -hmm. right? And if you're African American, we have trillions of dollars of buying power. Yeah. We're not broke. We just allocate our money and spend it differently, right? Mm -hmm. So first is understanding who are your loyal customers to because. I challenge people, don't just look on the internet and see what somebody's talking about buying. Don't look at my page and say, oh, Ashley bought this. I'm going to buy it because I'm, I'm a young girl. I, I'm an auntie. I don't have any kids. I done yep. quit my job, lost everything. <laughs> I have a different risk tolerance, right? Yeah. Some people don't like to watch their stocks go up and down, up and down. And, Mark, you know, like that drives people crazy. So it really depends on the type of investor you are. So I would say as a beginner, um, focus on where you're a loyal customer because it's easier to research a company that you know. Yeah. Not that boring hell. And I also buy what I know. Yeah. I don't, I'm not, I don't deviate. I don't care what's sexy on the internet. I stick to what I know yeah. that works for me. So like, for example, I own Amazon. Amazon makes a hundred billion dollars every 90 days, right? They're the wow. second largest employer in America, which means America can't afford to lose Amazon, right? right? I've watched Amazon evolve as a company over the years. So that's a company that I buy and I hold. So I like to buy and hold. I don't typically trade. I know tons of people who do, but for me, I don't have the time. Yeah. So it's more about how, how much time, because people think, yes, you can make good money as mm -hmm. a trader, but you have also have to allocate some good time to do that yeah. as well, mm -hmm. and I don't have that time. Yeah. So starting out, I would say make a list of those companies you know, use, and believe in, mm -hmm. because some of the biggest and best companies in this country run this country. Yeah. And they're, they're even from the phone you use. Like, yeah. these companies yeah. make big, we got trillion-dollar businesses now, and it's like we talk ourselves out of owning a piece yeah. of a trillion-dollar business that we give our money to anyway, just naturally. So I would say making a list of what you use, what you consume, and then start to research th those companies and start to consider buying those. But for me, I like to buy and hold. I like dividend paying investments. So these are companies where they take a portion of their profits and they share with their investors, their shareholders. And so every share you buy, you get a certain amount of income. Mm -hmm. I like growth stocks. Those are companies that are, are fast growing that might that typically will beat the average of all the stocks on the stock market. So for me, I'm a dividend investor. 
Okay. I'm a growth stock investor. Try the penny stock thing. Wait, <laughs> wait. It, I, again, I, I also like to wake up and know my company still exists. Yeah. I like to wake up and know that I didn't just lose 90% of my money. You know, and yeah. that and that is a personal preference. So people also have to check their emotions. Yeah. Are you do you some people like the risk, right? Mm -hmm. Some people want passive income. Some people want reliability. Yeah. I would just challenge people to not depend on savings accounts yeah. and to, to start putting their money into, into some of the biggest and best companies. But it really is about your personality and what you want. So for me to tell you what to do, mm -hmm. I will be doing you a disservice. Do what works for you based off your risk tolerance, your time commitment, mm -hmm. and your time horizon. Got it. Okay. So I'm about to ask you a question. I just thought about it. It may be a dumb question, but so I've always wondered this, right? So all right, I open up a brokerage, mm -hmm. brokerage account. I put money in it mm -hmm. and I buy a stock. Now, the money is still showing in my bank account or in my tr my trading account. Okay. But then is that money given to the company? Do they actually get that money? No. So so no. So what happens is there's an IPO, okay. which is an initial public offering. So yeah. for example, they take my company Empify. Uh -huh. We're private, okay. right? I'm a private company, which means nobody can invest unless I allow you to, which is considered a private investment. So that's like angel investors, yep. venture capital, things like that. My job is to grow this company where I have some sort of exit. I'm either going to have someone acquire Empify mm -hmm. or I'm going to have an initial public offering. Yep. Part of me wants to have an IPO just because there's not, there's not a lot of publicly traded companies on the stock market that are ran by blacks, let yeah. alone a black woman. Black woman yeah. So for me, it's like I'm either going to sell for billions of dollars <laughs> or my IPO yeah. and be a black woman who has a publicly traded company. Mm -hmm. So what happens is when a company is created, you think about how you want to expand, you need access to money. Yep. You can take out debt or you can receive cash and in exchange for cash, you give up equity and ownership of your business, right? Yep. So an IPO allows the public to have part ownership of their business. So now when they have an IPO, they have a certain amount of shares mm -hmm. out there. So look at a, like a box of pizza, right? If my yep. company amplifies a box of pizza and we're worth a billion dollars. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of little teeny slices at a certain price that ultimately add up to a billion. Yeah. What happens is an IPO allows the public to have a bunch of their slices of pizza. Yeah. And so that when that initial offering is when the company receives the money to help grow their company. But after that, it's just me and you exchanging money back and forth, trading on the stock market. So the company doesn't necessarily get that money mm -hmm. um, only in that initial public offering. When you typically are buying stock on the market after the IPO, it's called the secondary market. Got it. So okay. it's just me and you just exchanging assets, or it's just sitting there in your account. But the brokerage account is a middleman, so they find the buyer for you, they find the seller, and they merge the two, and they're the middleman that houses your assets. Wow. Got it. So for me to be able to buy a stock, somebody has to be willing to sell it. Which The good thing about the stock, stock market, which is not like the real estate market, there's always a buyer, there's always a seller. Got it. Okay. So, it's, so I would say... Stocks are a little bit more, not a little bit, a lot more liquid than a property. You don't have yeah. to sit and wait around for somebody to, to sell you the stock. It can happen in, in literally five seconds. Got it. So it happens instantly. So okay. it's more. So just in case something happens, you need the money, you can sell your stock and get the cash. Got it. Yep. I like that. So let's, while we're talking about real estate, what are your thoughts on real estate? Because a lot of people feel like that's a great place to put your money in. So it's Absolutely. Like money in bricks is yeah. a great place to be. What's so how I learned on Wall Street is you have a portfolio. And essentially, 20% of your assets, wait, let me make sure I get this right. Hold on, hold on. 80% of your assets is in marketable security, so like stocks, bonds, mutual funds, things that you could sell yep. and receive cash for, more liquid. 10% is in cash. Okay. And then 10% is in an alternative investment. So an alternative investment are the assets that have the ability to grow, but they're not as liquid. Things like real estate, things like private companies. So if you were to invest in my company, Empify, you're not going to flip your money tomorrow, right. but in five, 10 years, you might, right? Yeah. Same thing with a property. So personally, I've never bought a property. Okay. I dump all, at this phase of my business, I dump all of my cash back into my startup, yeah, right? For sure. Now, I do think real estate is a way to effectively build wealth. Now, there are a lot of people who think they need a lot of credit. Mm -hmm. they, need, they need good credit. They need a lot of money. They need a lot of time. So there's multiple ways you can get into real estate, just like in the stock market, right? Yep. I think you have to choose what works. We always tell people building wealth is like, there's like this big old fancy restaurant that we've been seeing all these fancy people eating in, yep. and we never thought we deserved to be at that restaurant. Now the door is open. Yeah. But when you walk into that restaurant, it's a buffet. <laughs> and you've been yeah. dying to eat the whole time, but your job is to try a little, eh, that's not for me. So for me, try penny stocks, eh, that's not for me. Yep. At this phase of my business, real estate, well, I actually want to buy a property in the next, next few months anyway. Yeah. But in this, when I was starting my business, it was like, uh, I don't have the money, definitely not borrowing money, don't have the time, let me just build this business big, right? right. 
Now, I definitely think you definitely share real estate, without a doubt. Yeah. I think America is designed to make you believe that home ownership is the true way to build wealth. Got it. But most people don't know that that most people don't know that when you put your money in a savings account or a bank account, they loan that money out. Correct. The yep. bank makes money off of you taking out debt. If we stop spending money and we stop taking out debt, there's no America. Forget the stock market. If you don't take out debt, you don't you don't uh, if you don't spend money to take out debt, there's no America. So America's going to encourage you to buy a house. Right. Because that's how they build their wealth, right? Correct. Now, I think buying a house is great, but how many people do we know save money, have a good job, and own a home, but still aren't wealthy? That's mm. not the only way to build wealth in this country. It's a great starting point, but not you can't finish there. So for those individuals who don't have the time, the money, or the credit, and but want to, want to get into real estate, you have to get creative, right? Yep. So for me, I thought I could just get a real estate license, mm. and that was just my way. So I got my <laughs> license after I left Wall Street. I never used it. But one of the things I saw on Wall Street was our clients' kids were making passive income in their portfolios. And so I, so at my job, my job was to literally help support a team of people who help manage assets for millionaires and billionaires. So for owners of basketball teams, celebrities, athletes, owners of these big companies that we give our money to all the time, I saw their bank accounts every day. Mm. So I saw where they live, where they shop, where they ate food, how they avoided tax, I saw everything. But I saw their trust fund baby kids, and they were living off passive income, And I'm, but their portfolio wasn't moving. So imagine you having a million dollar portfolio, but the kid is making 60, 70 grand every year, and that's what they live off of while they're in college. Mm. And so in my mind, I'm like, how is this happening? And what I realized is that they were investing in dividends. And so one of the ways that people who don't have the time, the money, the credit, to b go directly buy a property, REITs are a way you can build passive income. Okay. So, so here's how a REIT works. A REIT is a real estate company that owns, operates, and manages commercial real estate, right? Okay. Now, their job is to help, is to build, is to build income. So when you think about commercial real estate, they're not trying to flip the property. So first things first, you don't buy a REIT, R-E-I-T, to flip your money. Okay. So we're not here to get rich quick. Yep. You're here to build passive income. So what the REIT does, they, they find the property, they manage the property, they handle everything. But here's the thing, they're called a real estate investment trust. Anytime you see the word trust, think of protection. REITs are protected from corporate taxes. Okay. So in exchange for them not paying corporate taxes, they have to give out 90% of their profits to all their shareholders. Okay. So when you own a piece of a REIT, a share of a REIT, you are, by law, that REIT has to pay you a certain amount of income mm -hmm. based upon their profits. So for every share you own of a REIT, you get passive income. Look at it like for every property you own with a tenant, you get passive income. Right. The only difference is you don't manage the tenant. Mm -hmm. You don't have to fix anything. Yep. You don't have to call the bank, borrow money from the bank, hire an agent, have any closing costs, any of that. The real estate company, that REIT handles all the, all the legwork. So for example, in Atlanta, uh, Lennox and Phipps is owned by a REIT. Okay. Every share you own of that REIT, which is around $100, $120, something like that, you're getting paid 6 to 7% in dividends just by investing in that. So your job as the person investing, the more shares you buy, the higher your income would be. So let's go back to Wall Street. Let's say they have a million-dollar portfolio of REITs. Yep. They're getting 6 7% in income just off of owning those REITs. Again, don't do any of the work. Don't have to borrow money from the bank but they're sitting back and collecting income. For example, Vegas hotels, mm -hmm. a lot of Vegas hotels, a lot of malls, shopping centers, like Target pays rent to a REIT. So it's yeah. three types of properties. You got you have a person that can own it, mm -hmm. and you have a company that can own it, or a REIT can own it. One out of every three uh, properties yeah, yeah, yeah. is owned by a REIT. There's trillions of dollars out there, and people just think, hey, I can't get into real estate, yeah. I can't make money. And mm -hmm. so for me, my job at Empify is to get people to realize there is no other option but to learn how to invest in somebody else's business, build your own business. Because at this point, we can't work our way to wealth and we can't save our way to wealth. You have right. to invest your way there. Okay. I'm all for building a business, but while I'm building my business, I'm also letting Simon pay me every 90 days because they pay every quarter. I have mm -hmm. a six-year-old niece who invests in REITs. Some of the biggest companies that exist are like our REITs. Like, it's just... It's just mind blowing because I didn't know this until I worked yeah. on Wall Street. Like yeah. you don't learn this in school, but like a company called Realty Income just recently purchased the Bellagio Hotel. So when you go to Vegas and you stay at the Bellagio, you're paying rent to stay at that hotel. That REIT collects the money when you pay to stay there, or for the the stores or the restaurants mm -hmm. that pay rent, they collect all of that money and all their shareholders they pay out income every single month, and they own over thirteen thousand properties. I don't have time to own over thirteen thousand yeah. properties. But Realty Income has been paying out dividends 
for years. Every single month and every year, they've increased their dividend. So imagine having tenants paying you income, but you don't ever talk to them, and every year you can raise the rent, but you don't do any work. So it's just another alternative for people who may not have the money, the time. And most REITs are less than $200. Dang. Yeah. Okay, that's tight. I, okay. All right, I'm about to look at this REIT. <laughs> like that. All right. what, what are some mistakes you see a lot of new people make when it comes to investing? Um, or even people that's been doing it for a while. I think, I think when you don't come from money, there's this natural desire to have it. Mm -hmm. But there's also this fear of not having it as well. Mm -hmm. So I find that people buy. First off, they're petrified when they buy. You can't go into investing thinking you're going to lose because right. it's exactly what's going to happen. Yeah. You got to go in knowing whenever, whenever I make an investment, these companies now work for me. Yeah. Like REITs will bend over backwards to raise your dividend. Mm -hmm. Companies will like, for example, Verizon, right? Like one of the biggest telecom companies out there. They pay a good dividend, too. You own stock in Verizon, less than $50, they're giving out cash. Verizon will do everything to make sure you get paid because if they stop that dividend, mm -hmm. it makes that company look bad. Yep. And remember, a dividend that you get is a portion of their profits. The more cash they give you, what does that say about the profits yeah, of that company? Yeah. So I think we go in with this mentality that I'm scared, but it's like everything you do that you've never done, you should be scared. Yeah. But your job as an investor is not to just do something one time. When you're building wealth, it becomes a part of who you are. Like yeah. when I bought my first stock, I was, I was first of all, I was copying off of what rich people were doing, yeah, right? right? Like, and I ended up selling things and buying. I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that the billionaires were doing it. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I had no choice but to learn, yeah. right? So for me, I believe success leaves clues. You, just yeah. have, you have to follow the blueprint. If billionaires and I, at my job are investing, and we're we're talking to them because let's just say they got a they had a large ten million dollar check get deposited. Mm -hmm. It was our job to make sure that it got invested because when your money just sits there, you're losing money because of inflation. Yeah. I was just watching Home Alone not too long mm -hmm. ago. He went to the grocery store, spent like twenty thirty dollars at, at the grocery yeah. store, and had all these bags. And yeah. it's like that was in the nineties. Yeah, exactly. and it's so so the, the 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 cost of living goes up, but we're still making the same money at our jobs. Correct. So in my mind, you have to start thinking. I don't have a choice but to learn. Mm -hmm. You have to go in, I'm going to learn, I'm going to make mistakes, but I'm going to figure this out. Just like an entrepreneur, if you believe yeah. in what you're doing, mm -hmm. you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. You're just going to keep doing this until it works. And so you have to have that willpower to keep going. And I think people get so so frantic. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, I'm buying something. It's down today, but it's down like 0.1%. Like. Yeah. Companies are ran by people, and the market is driven by people's emotion. You can't dictate the, the a company, especially a good company that you're yeah. investing for the long term. You can't make a decision off of a company in a day. It took right. me years to make millions of dollars in business, mm -hmm. but if you would have judged me off of my first year in business, well, that's not fair, right? Yeah. So you have to look at when you buy a company and you own stock in a company, you're owning a piece of a company. Yeah. Now, you're not just buying a price. You're owning a piece of a company. So going in knowing I believe in the company that I own. Yeah. I know what they do. I know who runs it. Mm -hmm. I know how they make money. I know how they adapt in an economic downturn. I, I want to see how they adapt in this one. I want to learn what they did the last one. Yep. I want to know what their future is. And just I always tell people, like, if, if your homie was to say, can you give me some money and invest mm -hmm. in my business, what are you going to ask them? A lot of questions. Right. So that's the <laughs> same thing you need to, you need to go research with publicly traded companies mm -hmm. because all that information is public. That's why it's a publicly traded company. So going in knowing, mm -hmm. I'm going to figure this out. It's new, but it's it's not hard, yeah. and it can be easy. But I have to figure this out because I cannot rely on the, on my savings account. Right. I cannot solely rely on my job, so I gotta bet on me. Mm -hmm. And for me, I have no problem betting on a Jeff Bezos, yeah. this billionaire who built this 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 multi billion dollar business. It's like we hate rich people, want to build wealth, get rich, but don't think to invest in the rich, right? right and yeah. again, it's not about your feelings. Mm -hmm. It's about making money, growing your family's wealth, changing your family's mm -hmm. legacy, creating generational wealth, that has nothing to do with your emotions. It has to do everything with your mindset. Yep. And so I think going in with the right mind, I'm going to start small mm -hmm. and I'm going to build big. I'm not always going to win, yep. but over time I want to invest, I want to learn, I want to read, I want to stay up to date, and I'm going to figure this out. We go in thinking we're going to lose. The moment we lose, we sell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's but but that's because we're not making sound decisions. Mm -hmm. It's like when I buy certain companies, I know how long I want to hold it. Yeah. When I bought certain that's companies during the yeah, yeah. during the pandemic, there was like I bought Zoom, yeah, right? Zoom. Like yeah. Zoom was new. I bought that one. I was like, it just made sense. I, like, yeah. I feel like everybody about to be using this thing. But and but I also knew that there are way bigger companies than Zoom. Mm -hmm. Their companies could buy Zoom, right? Yeah. And it's like, but they were at the right place at the right time in an unpredictable environment. 
Zoom, I think I made like over 200%. The moment outside opened, I sold it because I knew it wasn't a long-term investment for me. Mm. I knew it was in that moment, that's what I wanted. But there are certain companies that I own that I've, that I've had for the past 10 years and I've watched them grow, I've watched them evolve, and I've watched the economy need them. There is something called too big to fail. Like, America needs these companies because they create the jobs. When their jobs are, that are created, people spend money. Where do you spend money? At these companies. Mm. You give them the money, they hire more people. America wins when money circulates. The, the moment money slows up, mm. that's not good. The moment money right. goes too fast, that's not good. So the Federal Reserve regulates the movement of money. So in this case, America can't live without publicly traded companies. Right. And the people who build the publicly traded companies have their money in other people's publicly traded companies. And that's how wealth is built. Like during the pandemic, the wealth gap got bigger. Yeah, it did. How did it get bigger? And they gave out trillions of dollars of free money and stimulus checks mm -hmm. because it's a mindset. People weren't going out saying, I'm going to invest. They were putting it back into the economy, making rich people richer. In my mind, it's like, let me just be a part of that. You can make yeah. your billions. I'll make a few thousand. I'll make, yeah. you know, like, and, and that's how I think. So it's not a, a defensive mind. It's mm. an offensive mind. Right. That's, so my question was going to be like, when do you know to sell? It's like, okay. And then when I sell, do I take that money and am I buying something else? Like, what's what's kind of like? How do you teach people? So, here's a here. So here's how I think about when to sell. First thing is why'd you buy, mm -hmm. right? Like, what's your intention for when you buy? Okay. So when I buy my REITs, my first thing is I want ten thousand dollars a month. I'm gonna buy as many shares as I can, and every share I own, I'm getting income. So the more shares I buy, the more income I get. I want to get to a space where my portfolio is producing $10,000 a month, right? Okay. I can do that. I have a six-year-old niece. I want her to have $1,000 a month. Mm -hmm. that, and I'm, I'm, that's what I want, right? So I'm building, I'm building with intention to get to that, right? Mm -hmm. When you buy a company, you have to know why you bought it. And, if you know, and as long as that company is still producing the way you want them to, mm -hmm. they're still growing, they're still profitable, and what you set out to achieve with that company is still happening, you have no reason to sell. Now, let's say, for example, things change. Yeah. Business model changes. Mm -hmm. Leadership changes. Your dividend changes. Yep. Now you have grounds to sell. For example, I bought AT&T years ago, right? Mm -hmm. AT&T is one of the most boring stocks that exists, right? Yeah. The price barely ever moved, mm -hmm. but they paid a good dividend, right? So people retire off stocks like AT&T. And I bought AT&T because I wanted that passive income. Bought it, and, and at some point, I forgot what year it was, not, probably a few years ago, they let go of certain parts of their business. Mm -hmm. If they let, if they're letting go of certain parts of their business, it's impacting their revenue. It's impacting their profit. Remember, the dividend is a portion of that. A portion of their profits come to me. Yeah. So if your profits are impacted, my dividend is impacted. Mm -hmm. So because they were revamping the business, they made an announcement and said they were cutting their dividend. All hell broke loose. Mm. So in my mind, you're cutting my cash flow. Right. So I have, I bought you for the cash flow. You're cutting my cash flow, rightfully so, because they changed. I mean, yeah. I understand, mm -hmm. but I don't have time for you to figure it out. Yeah. I'll let you figure it out while I go find another company that can give me the cash you were once giving me. So I sold it. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because the price dropped 50%. Wow. Because remember, people bought AT&T for the dividend. Right. You're not typically dividend, dividend stocks, their prices don't move rapidly. Mm -hmm. They're the boring, consistent companies, but they're consistently profitable. That's why they can pay you cash flow. Growth stocks like Empify, we go up, we go down, yeah. we all over the place. Mm -hmm. we, we're not that consistent yet because we're still growing. So if, in fact, the, the reason why you bought it has changed, mm -hmm. then you can, you can sell it. I'll give you another reason. Um, back in 2021, <clears throat> um, I was figuring out life. I was living in New York. Um, I was living in the Airbnb. I had left Philly where I was at, and I felt like I wanted more for my life. Right? Yeah. I went back to the one place that filled my cups. So I moved back to New York. But I didn't have the money I wanted to have to live the life I wanted. So I said, I know what building I was going to move to, and I'm going to figure out how to make the money to live the life I want. So I literally lived in an Airbnb for like eight months just trying to figure out what was next for me. right? But before that, I, moved, I was living in Paris. Wow. But I lived in Paris off my stocks. Hmm. So in this case, I had no desire to make money in my business. Mm -hmm. My staff was paid, but I, I didn't. I didn't want to be on the internet. I didn't yeah. want. I just wanted to be with Ashley. Mm -hmm. But I had. I had money. I, ha I had investments. Mm -hmm. So I sold some of my investments. So Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, all these billionaires, they made me rich. Mm -hmm. So I sold some of my gains to stay in four and five star hotels in Paris. So you have to think when you make these investments in these different companies. One, knowing why you bought it, mm -hmm. how long you plan to hold it, yep. but also if you have reasons for why you want to make money, then it's no, it's okay to sell. Now, yep. I didn't sell all my shares, yeah, but sure. I sold some 
because I wanted to travel. So now in my mindset, every year I got to go to Paris. Guess who's funding my trip? My stocks, right? right. So it's, it's sometimes you can sell some of your gains to pay down debt. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you can sell some of your gains to, to, buy a, to buy a house or to start your business. It's more of when you go in, what are they doing for you? Right. I know when I buy my REITs, you're creating passive income to supplement all the other money I'm making. I know when I invest in certain companies for my niece, you're going to put her through college. Mm -hmm. You're going to help her pay for prom. You're mm -hmm. going to make sure she never has to borrow from the bank the way I did to start my business or to go to college. So that's their job. Yep. If they stop performing at their job and they're not doing the work, they got to get fired. Yep. So you have to look at it like, like a basketball team. Yeah. If you're still performing on the court, which is why I put you on a team in the first place, then we're all good. The moment you deviate or my plans change, I got to let you go. And that's okay. I don't yep. have to sell all. I can sell some, but you might find something better. Mm -hmm. So when I sold AT&T, I found something better yep. that gave me a better dividend, and that's okay. You yep. know, so it's more so of understanding. And again, let's say you're a trader. Mm -hmm. You're trying to make a quick flip. You sell when you make that gain that you're looking for. Yep. So everybody, I think, I think people get so confused and we look at like investing, like everybody has to do the same thing. Yep. Investing is like sneakers. There's no one sneaker that is better than the other. Yeah. It's based upon what you want, what you like, the size of your foot, and what works for you. I think you got to get good at knowing what kind of foot you have. Got it. Because then you know what type of shoe you need to get. Yeah, I like that. All right, so entrepreneurial question, right? Because mm -hmm. So I'm all for, like, investing into Justin, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So it's like, but at the same time, you've got to put money aside, emergency fund, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. How what what would advice what advice would you have for like new entrepreneurs like okay I'm trying to invest in my dream my business but at the same time I do want to put some money into place that can maybe grow like what is that balance to where because I've been in both I've been the person that I mean you can over invest in your business too mm -hmm. and and I did that before whether it was payroll or people or sometimes stuff that I was doing right but then sometimes you can under invest into you know other places where you should have put your money at so like how do how how would you tell an entrepreneur that's getting started? So I'll tell you what I did. Because I was around rich people all day, mm -hmm. I saw what they did. I mm -hmm. saw how they ran their businesses. I saw how they invested for themselves and their children. Mm -hmm. I think long term. Okay. So it's at some point, I'm not going to run my business all day, every day. I still want to have multiple streams. Right. So you got to look at investing like a multiple stream. You got to look at the investment in you as a multiple stream. Everything has to give you a return on right. investment. Yep. So when I first started, when I left my job, I had $30,000 saved in my investments, mm -hmm. and I lost all of it in a matter of months. Like I kicked out my apartment, uh, maxed out credit cards, negative bank accounts. I had to move back to Philly and slept on my parents' couch for two years. Wow. In that moment, even when I had to sell everything I had, I still invested. Now, I might have been doing $10 a month, yeah. but you got to train the universe to know that you matter. Because if I'm not putting money here because I'm afraid that I don't have it, you now believe you don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. So in my mind, while I didn't have millions to set aside mm -hmm. or thousands, I could $10 my way to a million. Yeah. So while I still built my business, put everything in it, I still paid myself. And now, let me, let me, I didn't always do that. Mm -hmm. It took me a lot of therapy to realize I was worth paying myself. Yeah. I couldn't preach to the world, pay yourself first, because when we make money, we pay everybody, we take right. care of our kids, we pay our rent, we give everybody our money, we look up, we have nothing. It's because right. you didn't make you a priority. Yeah. So I'm in therapy session with my spiritual advisor and, and just people that are here to help me be better. And now you can't tell the world to pay themselves and you won't pay yourself. Hmm. You are now telling the world that your company matters more than you, but there's no company without you. Right. So you have to think about, and it's not just investing in your business. like. It's investing in the food you eat. It's investing in your, in your health, in your workouts, in your trainers and things like that. Yeah. You have to know that with that investment, it's going to garner a bigger return. Correct. And sometimes that's investing your time, it's investing your money. So in the beginning, I didn't always pay myself. I always invested small amounts okay. because I saw what wealthy people were doing. Mm -hmm. When my niece was born, she, when she was born, I had a couple months. The moment she got a social security number, mm -hmm. I invested for her. It didn't matter if I did or did not have money, if I had a profitable month or not. She mattered. But I opened her account with $35. Yeah. And, I, and so and this back, back when um, I started investing for her, I wanted to get her a share of Disney that was like $80, $90. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have it. So yeah. I bought 35, I bought fractional shares until I got to one full share. But what happened was as I made more, I already cultivated the habit of somebody yeah. who set money aside for the things that matter to me. So as I made more, I just added more. Yep. There was ne there's never been a point in my entrepreneur career that I did not pay my niece because yeah. I understand that 
this stops with me. Yeah. I'm the only one that's that's going to have to take out student loans and, and get kicked out of her apartment yeah. and max out her credit cards. That ends with me. Any generation after Ashley Fox, I'm going to make sure that they are financially educated. If I could do it for the world, why can't I do it for my family? Yeah. So, I, but again, it's because I saw it. Mm -hmm. This is what I saw where our clients made it a priority to build wealth for their children. Yeah. And it's like, if we don't do that and have that priority, our kids are just going to have to repeat that same cycle. So for me, it took me a while to value me, to mm -hmm. love me enough to say, I'm worth the investment, and so is my business. Mm. And I, again, one was an investment in Ashley, but if there's no Ashley, there's no business. So you got to take care of you and take care of your business at the same time. Got it. Now, I like that. I think that's a good... That's a good philosophy because that's one of the things that changed for me is I like because you know if you got a job it's easy to save money because it comes out of your check automatically. Yes and no. You know how many people it's hard to save. <laughs> yeah. The easiest way is to do it. So I also did it automatic. That's what I said. It has to be out of sight, out of mind. Yeah, yeah, it comes out automatically. Yeah. So I literally I set it up um, with my financial advisor. I was like, okay, every Wednesday we're gonna take a certain amount, and if it was I was making more money that mm -hmm. month, then we put in more. But it was like it was not even an option and so it was just like okay that money's got to be there and then you don't look at it and that to me was almost like having like a 401k taking mm -hmm. money out right, of your right, check right. having it automated so yeah I, I agree with that thousand percent and i think uh a lot of entrepreneurs probably need to hear that conversation yeah it's um, it's hard though like it, very hard i i had to learn how to love me first yeah to know that i was worth any investment yeah so yeah let i, I always have a segment in the show anyway we talk about like uh, i call it breakdown of breakthroughs mm -hmm. i believe every entrepreneur has break a breakdown and a lot of times what knocks people out of entrepreneurship is a breakdown mm -hmm. in something like you just share it when you went through but i also believe there's always a lesson in the breakdown that allows you to break through and if you get to do that then it'll take you to the next level whatever that is you shared a little bit about a breakdown because I, I do think some entrepreneurs especially in this climate they're gonna probably they ain't gone through one yet is <laughs> i ain't gonna speak that up <laughs> but at some point you're gonna go through ebbs and flows as an entrepreneur how did you bounce back so lose your house or apartment car credit cards and then how do you dig your way out what's the mindset um, I was always a winner mm -hmm. from the day I was born. I was an athlete. I yeah. had to be the best in everything mm -hmm. I did. What'd you play? I played, I played basketball. I played softball and I stuck with tennis. So tennis, I was like traveling the country playing tennis. Well, I, I was played ready. pickleball. You know what I'm saying? I don't mess with uh, No, <laughs> that, that is, so I was playing pickleball and I kept missing the ball. I'm, that is not tennis at all. So yeah. I, I'm going to stick to tennis. Yeah. I'm going to stick to tennis. Um, but for me, it was what I was reading. Okay. It was... I think the biggest difference, and I can't speak for everybody, is I saw the light. Yeah. I knew what the end destination looked like. Mm -hmm. You can't unsee things like that. When yeah. you're in the home of a billionaire, you go to the south of France and you're on a yacht, or you're at Yankee State, like you're sitting courtside. Like I lived a life based off of the clients we served. Yeah. So my perception of what I knew I could get was what I saw every day on mm -hmm. Wall Street. So I couldn't unsee that. Yeah. And I also learned that all of our clients, and granted, I had one of the highest paying jobs out of school, mm -hmm. but I was not on track to be a client. Right. And so I'm sitting here keeping rich people rich, and it's like, well, where do I fit in it? Because I'm there for 10 years. I'm still not a client. Right. You, I, they, they would have sent me downstairs. I, didn't, I wouldn't have had that $25 million. Mm -hmm. But what I learned is all of our clients either invested in their own idea or somebody else's idea. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, I knew that I didn't belong. And I knew that I was here for something bigger. But interestingly enough, I always wanted to be a teacher. Wow. But I didn't become a teacher because I went the money route. I had to have the money. I had to have the clothes. Like, that mm -hmm. was my thing. Yeah. And But when I left, it just felt right. So I would say when I left my job, July 12, 2013, that was the first time that I operated off of feeling and not logic. Because logic would have told me, stay at your fancy job. Yeah. You got this fancy degree. You're making good money. You look good on paper. But I wasn't happy. Yeah. And it's like I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't understand why because I did everything I could to get on Wall Street, but I wouldn't do everything I could to stay. Yeah. And I left with the intent that I was going to be the woman that exposed the world to what I saw. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get an Ashley Fox anywhere. You couldn't yeah. get the exposure that I had. You couldn't get the mind or the belief. So I knew who was going to get it done, yeah. and I knew why. I had no idea how. Mm -hmm. But I didn't. it didn't matter because I had no choice. So when I left Wall Street, there was no plan B. So my no plan B is why it had to work. And, I, you know, again, I lost everything, but my purpose and my business was never created to make money. I learned how, even when we started, we started to create programs in school systems, prison oh. systems, 
I started to teach for free because I felt like, why are we not teaching this in school systems? So I, I literally, as a, I was a financial advisor before I started teaching in schools, and I, I, my revenue was down 50%, and I'm teaching kids trying to learn how to teach in the school system. How do mm -hmm. I make a program that is undeniable that schools can't live without? Yeah. It took me some time to do it, but it wasn't because I had to make money. It's because I needed our generation to see what I saw, and I was the only translator to give it to you. Yep. So that is what kept me going. So I never chased money. Mm -hmm. I always, I, like, I knew if I made some idea, like our clients, yep. I was going to cultivate that wealth. But I built something that wasn't about money. Like to this day, if you gave me $100 million right now, I'd wake up every single day to do what I do because there, there is no plan B. I don't want to do anything else. And yep. I think some people create businesses to make money. I found a way to make money. Yeah. Investing wasn't cool back then. Like yeah. now the world's ready to receive it, but I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years and I've been through hell and back and I actually I I, I feel like I know a little something yeah. about it. But my my reason for build, being an entrepreneur was bigger than me and I felt like if I quit, then I let the world now. Hmm. And I and I I felt like I couldn't do that. And even though which is crazy because the world didn't even know that I was living yeah. to to serve them. But I knew in my heart nobody could do it the way that I do it. So I think at that point of getting kicked out, losing everything, um, that's all I could hold on to. It was like once you get to you get to a point in entrepreneurship, you're in too deep, mm -hmm. you can't get out. Yeah. And you know too much, you can't go back. Mm -hmm. So I was stuck. Yeah. And it's like I don't know what to do, but this has to work. But I think every little inch of success, every comment, every thank you kind of led me to know I'm on to something. Right. And then over the years, the money started to reflect it. But the money came years later, you know, yeah. like I was sitting on a, my parents' couch for two years knowing that this could work, but nobody understood what I was trying to do, you know. So yeah. for me, it was never about money. So that's what kept me going. It was never about money. The money came as a result of me showing myself that I could do it. Yeah, I like that. Uh, we were talking earlier. and You said you're a little bit of an introvert, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so, can't tell this. <laughs> no, but like. What would you say to the entre entrepreneur that is an introvert and they're trying to like jump out of their shell and you know maybe whether it's getting out there on social media or putting their business out there? How did you navigate that? Well, I've been going to therapy since 2017. Okay. So I have I've been going to therapy. I have an executive coach. I have a spiritual advisor. I spend thousands of dollars every month on Ashley. Mm -hmm. I have to be the best version of me. And there was a point where. I remember I was like featured in the news mm -hmm. and granted I never I didn't even know what that meant I never signed up to be in the news this is back in like 2014 I was all over the internet and I was so scared and then I was asked by Forbes to become a writer black enterprise mm -hmm. to just write about finance and I'm not in my mind like I'm not a writer I don't even know right. what I'm doing yeah. but my mentor said to me it's selfish of you to hide who you are from the world mm. knowing what you know Wow. and so in that moment it was like you're right because what are the odds of a, a black woman who went to Howard University, worked on Wall Street, has this desire, she quits her job, loses everything to build this, you can't take what I know. Yeah. And it's like, well, where else do you get that? Mm -hmm. And so when he said that, it kind of was like, okay, whatever the world, the universe wants me to be, I'm going to be it. And so I think my career has evolved by the opportunity. I believe like if the opportunity was presented, it was for me to take advantage of. I'm either going to learn something or, or become a better version of me. And as the opportunities came, I took it. Now, was I scared every opportunity? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But what I learned is I'm an introvert, but I'm an extrovert in my craft. Mm. So you have to be an extrovert in That's your craft because if you don't, if you are not the loudest person in the room for what you believe and what you do, nobody's going to believe it's possible. So I had to learn how to believe in me. Yeah. And the more I believed in me, the world started to believe. But I had to believe that I could do it. And as I believed, the bank account got bigger, yep. the audience got bigger, the company got bigger. But, yeah, so I'm an extrovert in my craft. You put me on stage, I'll kill it. But as soon as that's, it's over, it's like, okay, I'm ready to go home. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's like, that's like, yeah. but, but I also have to then recognize this is who you are for the world. Yeah. you know. And, and I've accepted that. Yeah. And I think it took me some time took me a lot of healing yeah. to accept the fact that this is who you are. Like, I never wanted to be a public person, mm -hmm. but I've always had a vibrant personality. And yeah. I, I have to own that, too. Like, you're, you can't just quit Wall Street and create something and think you're going to change the world and stay in the house. Right. You know, so right. so yeah. 2024 is all about me, like, going outside. Yeah. I like that. But it's been times I've been outside and I went back because I got scared. <laughs> and it's like, yeah. all right, but again... If you're going to say you want to do this for the world, you can't hide it from the world. Yeah. So you got to be the biggest one cheering, cheering yourself on and cheering your company on. Yeah, I like that.
be an introvert, but you got to be an extrovert for your craft. Yeah. I like that. That was good. That's good stuff. All right. So um, where can people find you? Like, because if, okay, if I'm hearing this conversation, because this is some questions, I, I'm still looking to that read thing. Cause I, <laughs> I, I study that a little bit. Um, but if I want to find out more about this, where can I find you? And do you have anything that anybody can tap into that um, you got come, tap into that um, you got coming up? So we are we're having our second five day virtual summit, okay. our cash flow creation summit. So we were talking about reach, we're talking about dividends. So these are for the individual. This this summit is for the individual who wants to build passive income. Okay, they want to change their life for the new year. Mm -hmm. They know they, they're tired of being frustrated. Yep. They want to do something. Might not have a lot, but they're willing to start and build big. But it's focused strictly on dividend-paying investments. So how can I find these big companies, these REITs, and collect this passive income for myself and my family? This is the second one. The first one we had over 1,300 people. Wow. We, we're going to have thousands of people. And so, again, starting the new year off, getting your mind right, getting your money right. But if you, if you come into the summit, you're going to get results. Yeah. You show up every day, we're going to tell you what to do, when to do, how to do it, but we're also going to do it with you. So, so for the summit, uh -huh. mycashflowcreation.com. Okay. Register and get there. Now, I have a couple free resources as well. Cashflow creation training, free class, showing you the basics mm -hmm. on how to create a dividend-paying portfolio. But on social media, underscore Ashley M. Fox, empify.com, E-M-P-I-F-Y.com, to get access to everything. But, yeah, this listen, this year... It's, it's, it's time for us to build. I think we can no longer rely on our jobs. Mm -hmm. We can't rely on a banking system. We can't rely on the government. It's time to take what we have, build big. Mm -hmm. We can start small, but we can build big. But I think it's really about changing our mindsets. Yeah. Because we don't have to have a lot to build wealth in this country, but you have to have the will to start to build yeah. wealth in this country. Yeah. No, I love that. I love that. That's, that's solid stuff, man. I just learned a lot. I'm not going to lie. I learned, I learned a lot, and I want to learn some more, so we got to yes. make sure we talk. I know we were talking a little bit about leadership. I think, you know, you know, Building, uh, you know, wealth is a team sport. I always tell people you can't do it by yourself. And, uh, you know, like, uh, to be able to grow leaders and to be able to grow your money, like, all those are great things. So I wanted to give you something, cause just from my conversation earlier. <laughs> uh, Philly, you got that, that uh, the book from me. It's, it's actually two books um, I'll share with you. Um, and I, uh, so I'll give them to you, ma'am. Oh, it's socks, you. you know what I'm saying? You make sure you get, get your gift. But so this one, John Maxwell, Developing the Leader Within You. Nice. Um, it's a really good book. He actually has two. One of them is Developing the Leaders Around You. So that's okay. the follow-up to this one. So I would say look into that one, too. So that was that one's yours. Thank you. And then The Speed of Trust. Mm. Um, so I'm reading uh, four, four Principles of Execution. Yeah. He's a... Yeah. 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 So this one right here. Thank you. Good, good for team building, you know? Like, yeah. You know, so um, anytime somebody... Those, those are books, two books that really helped me. So I always like to pass them on. Um, the good. people. So Thank you. yeah, let me know how you like them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you gave me some gems, throw some back. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's how we do. John Max was my guy. I haven't read one of his books in a minute. Yeah. You know, he was actually kind of. That's one of the reasons I got into like the leadership space because mm -hmm. he's really dope. But there was a phase in my life it was hard to listen to his audios because he's just very mm. like. I'm not really an audio girl. I'm a reader too. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I'm yeah. A, I'm an audio person, but yeah. I, but stuff like this I'll read. So I actually have something for you. What? Okay. Can hey. you read it out? I don't get, get no gifts on the show. Oh. All right, so you got to wear this with pride now, okay? All right, let's see. You got to tell the world you're building wealth. Okay, I'll do that. Brick by brick. Okay, let me help you out. Yes. Build, I am building wealth brick by brick. I think people I like think we need to have a lot of money, and we have to get it perfect. Yeah. But in order to build a mansion, you got to lay the first brick. Yeah. Share by share, brick by brick. I like that. And we got you a nice wealth builder notebook. So when you For research real? your REITs... Yeah. Start to jot it down. What, what are your thoughts on, uh, so, yes. like, the shopping mall, like, that that space of business? Do you feel like, do you see that adjusting at all? So, so here's how you got to think. This is good. This is good. Because I bought Simon during a pandemic. Yeah. And everybody and was like, why are you buying Simon? Nobody's going to malls anymore. Simon is the number one mall operator in America. Yep. Right? That's somebody's last name. Mm -hmm. So, while REITs have different types of properties, they still have the real estate. So one of the things that I look for is how are they pivoting? So malls are not going to be non-existent. But for example, Lifetime Fitness over there by Phipps, mm -hmm. Nobu Hotel, that's a Simon property. Wow. So so they're evolving into different spaces to grow. But here's the thing, Simon just increased their dividend. So while the economy might be doing not so good, some REITs are doing well. Wow. So I think... I don't go heavy into the retail space of REITs, yeah. but I do like Simon. I also like to buy the biggest and best. Yeah. So I don't I don't necessarily buy the small boys. Yeah. I might have some, 
But when I think about the biggest, like I own a REIT called Realty Income, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they have recession-proof type tenants like 7-Eleven, Dollar Tree, Dollar General, right? I, I like those types of boring REITs, right? Like yeah. they're, they're boring, yeah. but they pay good income. Yeah. And they've never missed a payment. They incre they've increased their dividend for over 25 years every year. So imagine getting paid every year, every month, and every year they give you more money. So wow. I don't necessarily buy the small ones. Mm -hmm. I like to buy the biggest and the best. And so I personally do like Simon. I don't own all the retail REITs, yeah. but I don't think malls are dead, yeah. but I do think Simon is figuring it out, evolving, and they're still making money, so I'm okay with that. There we go. I like yeah. that. Thank you for that, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I would say this. like. Money is an important conversation to have, um, and we always talk about making it, but then you also got to talk about at some point you're not going to want to work every single day of your life. Mm -hmm, correct. So money going to have to work for you. Yes. So it's a, the, the best time to start is uh, today. So hopefully y'all learned something from this episode. Like I said, I certainly did. And if you want to learn more, she's got the summit that's coming up. I would definitely uh, tap into that. Uh, excited to learn. Uh, there's welcome. I'm gonna check that out. Yeah, too. You right? listen. You know we listen. Mm -hmm. We go. We got to get that account open. I also recommend too. If you do invest in stocks and things like that, that's fine. If the goal is to build passive income, just open a separate brokerage account. Okay. Folk, when you buy those dividend paying investments, those REITs have a separate account. I like Charles Schwab because they have really good uh, they have really good structure to managing your passive income and predicting what income you'll have. But having a separate account, put your money in there again. You're not there to flip it. You're there for, to, for it to grow income over time. And just consistently add to it every single month, and you'll watch your dividends grow. Um, but yeah, for yeah. sure. You need, listen, again, I'm I'm all for buying a property. That's yeah. that's I'm this is getting done this year. Yeah. But I also own REITs. I also own stocks. I also run my business. There's multiple ways we could build wealth. And I think not one thing works for everybody, but focusing only on one thing should not only work for you. That makes sense. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. See, we're gonna get some gems, man. That's what I'm talking <laughs> about. So y'all tap into the episode. Y'all just got, you know, a play from Ashley Fox. <laughs> Go run it. We'll see y'all on the next episode. What's going on? Listen, make sure you guys go to runtheplaystore.com. Get your official Run to Play gear. We talk about shirts, socks, jackets for everybody that's run to play all across the world. Are you ready? We're going to run the yeah. play. Let's Do you go. know what it's like to come for nothing at all? But every day you just want it all. Do you know what it's like? Every day facing your fear, but believing that your blessing is near. Do you know what it's like growing up broken than most, but still be